Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Joe Iwanaga. I'm from uh, Japan. I'm doing a, a senior researcher here, and my specialty is uh, anatomist and oral surgery. So I'm going to talk about uh, some of the dental nerve block, which is probably unfamiliar with you, but you know we need to know this for some to understand the feeling of some patients, you know, patient thought, and to be a good patient. You know, have you ever had some uh, surgery of the wisdom tooth before? Yeah, probably you got some uh, dental nerve block already. We have a bunch of uh, different kind of uh, dental nerve block, but this is too many for 15 minutes. So I'm going to focus on this inferior nerve block, which is a very you know, important to understand in anatomy. So I'm going to review some of the anatomy of the infratemporal fossa and pterygomandibular space. So this is a kind of a picture of the procedure. So this is from a Netter's atlas. Um, so inferior nerve is a branch of the mandibular nerve, which is a you know third division of the trigeminal nerve B3, and the top one called the tympani nerve is from the facial nerve, which has a gustation, a taste sensation from the facial nerve and to the lingual nerve, and then below the called the tympani nerve we have an inferior nerve which is going to the mandibular foramen. So this is a target of this uh, nerve block. So inferior nerve, again, is a branch of the V3 entering the mandibular foramen, giving off the men mental nerve, which is uh, from the mental foramen, and then giving, uh, supplying the sensation of the mandibular, all the mandibular teeth on the ipsilateral side, and then also the chin, the skin of the, in the chin, and some of the cheek, and the other thing is uh, external acoustic, acoustic meatus from the auriculotemporal nerve. There are a lot. So if you know if you if you are a dentist and if you do a inferior nerve block to the patient, actually I have a one experience which I was a patient, and then I got a, this nerve block, and I checked all the sensation, and then I had some strange feeling in the internal acoustic meatus. I can't feel anything. Actually, anterior wall of the external acoustic meters, but we need to know this, you know, field of anesthesia to do the block, because patient maybe claim, maybe ask you, why does my ear numb? Uh, so this is a picture of the infratemporal fossa. This uh, biggest one is the inferior nerve. Posterior to the inferior nerve, we have a nerve to mild height which innervates the mild hyaline muscle and anterior belly of the digastric. And the anterior to the inferior nerve, we have a lingual nerve, which has the you know, sensation of the anterior two thirds of the tongue, you know, taste and general sensation. So if you cut this uh, lingual nerve, we can't feel any you know, general sensation, compression, temperature, pain, that, that is good maybe, and then taste. If you eat ice cream, you can feel anything more. You know, it's, it's a problem. And then the other things, you can see the posterior branch here. This is a middle mean, uh, sorry, the auricular temporal nerve, which has a sensation of the you know, temporal region and the external acoustic meters and some of the you know, branch to the parotid gland. Have you ever heard about the Fry's syndrome? Um, this is a disease. So if you have a surgery on the parotid gland, you can cut this branch of this auricular temporal nerve, which has a parasympathetic fiber. So if you cut this uh, nerve, especially the branch to the parotid gland, this cut nerve re to the other area, like a sweat glands. So if you bite or if you chew, you can sweat. This is a huge complication. So this, is, this often happens after surgery of the parotid gland. This is another picture which shows a, called a tympani. Can you see? The deep to the inferior nerve. This is an inferior nerve, lingual nerve called the tympani. It's deep to the inferior nerve from the facial nerve. The posterior branch is, again, a regular temporal nerve. 
Do you know what this picture shows? This, I colored this uh, yellow by Sharpie, actually. <laughs> this is in the middle year. So I removed the tympanic membrane, and then now I'm showing the incus and stapes. So between these two oscules of the middle ear, we have a caudal tympani. So caudal tympani or originates from the facial nerve going through the middle ear and goes to tongue. It's a long way, but interesting. And then go back to the inferior alveolar nerve. This is a superficial picture of the face, lower face. So left, you know, this is a deep, lower deep. And then this is the mental area. So this is a mental frame here. So this is, all these branches are mental nerve. It's very long. It has so many branches. So which innervates the lower lip, angle of the mouth, you know, the chin, everything. And also gingiva of the anterior, you know, lower, lower teeth. This is another picture of the infratemporal fossa. Again, we see an inferior alveolar nerve, lingual nerve, called the tympani, auricular temporal nerve. And the other things which is important is, uh, you know, as uh, Dr. Prickett mentioned before, intracranially, we see the same artery, infratemporal fossa. This is a middle meningeal artery. So I think you learned, you have learned already middle meningeal artery arising from maxillary artery and go through between the branch of the auricular temporal nerve. So the auricular temporal nerve usually forms a circle, and then middle meningeal artery go through this circle. This shows clearly the course of the middle meningeal artery. Also, actually, we, have, we often have an accessory meningeal artery, which is a kind of a variation of the anatomy. But accessory meningeal artery arise from sometimes middle meningeal artery, sometimes from the maxillary artery, variable. And also the anterior branch we see is a buccal nerve, buccal nerve. Buccal nerve in a very, uh, you know, mucosa of the lower molar teeth, gingiva, okay. Now, I think you can understand these you know, very complicated you know, drawing, but probably you already know most of these branches. So, go back, not go back. Also, to understand inferior alveolar nerve block, we need to understand the muscle, especially the masticator muscles. We have four masticator muscles, four. Masseter here, temporalis, and medial and lateral tailwood muscles. Especially medial and lateral tailwood muscle is very hard to understand because it's very three-dimensional. So the right drawing is a, you know, the view of the, from the posterior, posterior view. So this is the medial tailwood muscle. And upper one is the lateral tailwood muscle. And the left drawing shows the uh, lateral tailwood muscle on the top. And below the lateral tailwood muscle, we see a medial tailwood muscle. So this area is called infratemporal fossa, and also the medial, the, sorry, lateral to the medial tailwood muscle, we have a tailwood mandibular space, which is a target of the inferior alveolar nerve. So this shows the field of anesthesia for inferior alveolar nerve block. So if you do this procedure, this yellow area is become numb. White tongue, because lingual nerve is very close. You see it. Lingual nerve, and the other area is innervated by inferior alveolar nerve and mental nerve. You know, this is the innervation of the mental nerve. How about this? This is black. This is not innervation of the inferior alveolar nerve. Actually, this is a buccal nerve, okay? So probably when you have, when you had a, you know, surgery of the wisdom tooth, I think you should have some <coughs> incision here. Did you feel pain? Probably you, you slipped. So I think a doctor, you're, you're, you're a dental surgeon, you're a dentist, 
put some other block, which is called Buckner block. This is the uh, area of the Buckner. So to do some of these kind of surgery, we need to block the inferior vial nerve and Buckner block. All right, so let's go to the technique. We need to know some you know, bony landmark, some landmark on the soft tissue to do this procedure. So this is a you know, dry mandible. So we have a external oblique ridge on the lateral side of the mandibular ramus and internal oblique ridge. So we can feel easily the external oblique ridge when you put the, your thumb on the lateral side of the ramus. But internal oblique ridge is a little too deep. Maybe you know, it's very tough to touch the patient's internal oblique ridge because it's too deep. But you, can, you, you should you know, feel the external oblique ridge first. And then take mandibular fold. If you open the jaw, you can see some fold. This is a fold here. This is a fold. Don't worry, I will go around the, all the stations you know, when we do this procedure, so I will show you. And then yellow, you know, yellow area is called the pterygomandibular space. This is a target. So needle trajectory is uh, you know, 45, almost 45 degrees from the contrasted side of the target. <coughs> and then the needle should be put on the premolar on the contrasted side. And the, probably this is um, familiar with you. Occlusal plane is uh, like a um, plane of the lower teeth, you know. So 10 millimeter above this occlusal plane and 45 degrees from the contralateral side of the premolar. So this is a review. Take a mandibular fold. Internal oblique ridge, maybe we can feel. Premolar on the contralateral side. The millimeter above the occlusal plane. This is, you know, a lot of things to remember, but you don't have to remember. I will teach you later. And depths of the needle should be 20 to 25 millimeters. This is uh, approximately. So, yeah. All right, that's all. Very easy procedure, but you need to know some anatomy before you do this procedure, right? Any questions? Is there anybody who wants to be a dentist? No? <laughs> All right. Thank you.